Okay, I'd like to thank Rabbi Singer for um, bringing his time and his expertise to answer our questions. My question is, is it, you know, Christians say that only Yahweh can forgive sins. Um, so if Yeshua says to someone, your sins are forgiven you, does that prove that he actually is equal with God or God in the flesh, as Christians believe? Um, thank you for answering the question and um, just wanting to discover who Yeshua truly is um, and why he was supposedly crucified. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, because in Christianity they say he was crucified for being, uh, for saying he was God in the flesh. Thank you. <laughs> good. Okay, cool. Sound good, Rabbi? Yeah. Okay, take it away. Let me express the question as I've heard it expressed by many Christians over the years. And that is, in the Gospels, in the Christian Bible, we see that Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. For example, the paralytic who is brought before Jesus, actually lowered down in through the roof, after healing him, says to him, your sins are forgiven. Jesus then accused, how could you say they're forgiven? How could you make such a claim? It must mean that Jesus is God, because after all, who has the power to say that your sins are forgiven? Only God has that prerogative that I forgive your sins. And if Jesus is saying, I forgive your sins, then it must mean that Jesus is claiming to be God. This is used by Christians as a response to the charge that nowhere in the Christian Bible does Jesus claim to be God. Because after all, how is it that Jesus could forgive sin if he was not God? Moreover, Christians make the point that you see that the reaction of the Jewish people, that they were stunned, they're saying that where could it be that this person could forgive sin? It must, so even the Jews perceived that Jesus' behavior and activity in, indicated that he was claiming to be a divine being, and that bore on the wrath of those Jews who rejected Christianity. So you see, even the Jews understood it in that vein. We do find this in the Gospels, but in fact, the language used in the Gospels is not what Christians say. Jesus in the Gospels is saying that your sins are forgiven in the passive sense. We find, for example, in Mark 2, 5, where Jesus is addressing the paralytic, it says, my son, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't say, I forgive your sins. What Mark's view is, Jesus was taking the prerogative of what the priests had in the temple. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 4 and chapter 5, that the priests shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. So we see it openly that whether it is the, an example, the context is the sin offering or in the guilt offering. We see there in these chapters that the priest tells the person who's bringing the offering, these are offerings for unintentional sins, just so you know, or in the case of the guilt offering, meaning a carbon usham, the sin could have been a unintentional sin or an intentional sin, but the, but the sinner confesses sin with, without any witness. It means he just came forward and said, I did it. So in this case, only in those cases could a person use a sacrifice, could a person bring an offering, and then the, sa the priest could say, your sins are forgiven. So therefore, what is being conveyed in the Gospels is not that Jesus says, I forgive your sin, but rather your sins are forgiven. And what is being conveyed is that Jesus was, had the prerogative or was saying what the priest would say in the book of Leviticus. And in fact, as it turns out, in the Gospels, even if we go, we leave the Synoptic Gospels and we march into the, into the Gospel of John, where about 90% of the book of John is found nowhere in the Synoptic Gospels, we f and we find the highest Christology in the entire Christian Bible, where Jesus is portrayed as some sort of God in John's famous prologue of chapter 1, verse 1 through 18. So even in John, we are told that Jesus could do nothing of his own, including forgiving sin. And Jesus, we are told, says, 
Now, I don't believe Jesus said this, but John is saying that Jesus said this in John 5.30, I can do nothing of my own, but only of the one who sent me, which means that Jesus is completely subordinate to God who sent Jesus as the Son of God. The Son of God here means someone who is a messenger of God, who is doing the work of God on earth. Jesus could do nothing of his own. He cannot forgive any sin of his own. If it is true what Christians claim, that without the shedding of blood there is no atonement, Hebrews 9.22, and Christians argue routinely, where is your blood sacrifice? Where is your atonement? How could you be forgiven your sin? You Jews don't have a sacrificial system. And therefore, it must be that Judaism as practiced today is the effect of religion because you don't have the sacrifice of Jesus. You don't believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross. So the question might go to, well, how is it that Jesus, how is it that the paralytic was forgiven of sin? Jesus didn't even die on the cross yet. How is that even possible? How could John the Baptist be baptizing people, we are told in the Gospels, that people were being baptized by John the Baptist for the remission of sin? In what way did getting baptized atone for your sins? But I, I'm going off a little bit of a tangent, but I want to spark an awakening in your mind. I want you to think carefully. So the answer is, if you, you look at Luke 5, you look at Mark 2, you look at Matthew 9, you see clearly Jesus is saying your sins are forgiven. He doesn't say that I forgive your sin. Now, I'm not in any way being an, apolog an apologist, <laughs> the defender of Christianity. What I am saying is that the writers of the Christian Bible, the writers of the Gospels, whoever they were, they were conveying that Jesus had the prerogative of the priest that we find in, Levitica, in the book of Leviticus. And number two is we clearly see that Jesus is saying that nothing he can do of his own accord, but of the one who sent him. And therefore, Anything Jesus would do in the Christian Bible, according to the Christology that the, new, that the authors of the New Testament had, was not because of a prerogative that Jesus had, but only because of the one who sent him. So this is very, very clear. Anyone should look this up. Jesus does not say, I forgive you sin, but rather, your sin is forgiven. Well, that was told to people by priests in the temple. So therefore, are priests also God? Are priests also divine? The answer is that's nonsense. Rather, Jesus is being cast by the gospel writers as the priest, as the one who had the prerogative of the priest found in the book of Leviticus. I want to make this point as well. There are many instances in the Christian Bible where Jews are looking to kill Jesus because they're accusing him of making himself out to have prerogatives that are only God, or that Jesus was making himself equal to God. A famous example of that is in John chapter 10, verse 30, 31, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one, and we are told that the Jews pick up stones, and Jesus asks them, why are you stoning me? Is it for the great works that I do? And the Jews, we are told, say, it is not because of the miracles that you're doing, but it's because you make yourself equal with God. So many Christians will bring a proof from the reaction of the Jews to what Jesus says, that Jesus was clearly holding himself out to be God, because you see that the Jews wanted to kill him for behaving this way. It goes without saying that this could have never happened. The Jews had bigger problems than this. They had an empire to deal with. But what is important, and people miss, is that the, the, Christian, the authors of the Christian Bible in the Synoptic Gospels and in the book of John are always characterizing the Jews of being clueless about the truth, of missing the point, of being wrong about everything, that they didn't understand who Jesus was. In fact, we take our earliest gospel, the book of Mark. The book of Mark is a, an intriguing book in that for the first half of the book of Mark, meaning uh, we have a, a, a book of 16 chapters for the first eight chapters, for the half of the book, no one even knows who Jesus is. No one understands who he is. This is a, a big riddle. As it turns out, the Gospels are portraying the Jews of being wrong about everything, misunderstanding Jesus. So therefore, the argument that the Jews are getting it right in these accusations against Jesus does not reflect what it says in the Gospels. In the Gospels, the Jews are wrong about everything. And you can see this openly. In case you're uncertain that what I'm saying to you is accurate, Look at John chapter 10, but go to 30 and then 31, 32, and 33. 
when the Jews say that you make yourself equal to God, Jesus' response is, doesn't it say in your law that you are God? Well, what does that mean? Jesus is there, we are told by John, stating that it says somewhere in the Jewish scriptures, you are gods. Well, it does say that. Where would it say something like that? That's in Psalm chapter 82, verse 6. In this passage, judges are called gods. Now, why would a judge, a Jewish judge, ever be called God? This is a practice in Tanakh that when someone teaches the word of God, someone proclaims the word of God, someone's a prophet, they are called gods. You'll see this explicitly in Exodus 21 and 22. And that's what John's Jesus is saying. It says in your scripture about judges, meaning someone who is teaching the law, that they are gods. So in that case, that's how I am, in a sense, a God, meaning I am teaching what God is teaching. And that's when Jesus says that the Father and I are one. It doesn't mean in the case of John that Jesus is God, but rather he is of one accord with God. And in case you're not sure that my, my um, exegesis of this text is accurate, I urge you to go to John 17, 11. Uh, we have a very long dialogue. It's a conversation between Jesus and God. And of course, who would Jesus be talking to? Is he talking to himself? But there in that passage, Jesus is praying to God that the disciples should be one as we, meaning Jesus and God, are one. Is Jesus asking that the disciples are gods, that they're part of the triune Godhead? Of course not. What he's praying is that the disciples should be, in the Greek word is hen, which means one, of the same accord as Jesus and the Father of the same accord. And here we see exactly what is meant by in John chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. The earliest Christians did not believe this, and this notion that Jesus was fully God, equal to the Father, is an improvement, is a later development. It is a self-inflicted wound of the church from which it never recovered. Very good. You guys can find uh, Rabbi's books, two-volume book set, by the way, at Amazon.com or at his website uh, as well. Uh, Rabbi, there's still you still have other debate uh, DVDs there. Um, are you going to uh, have any more of your four-part uh, DVD series? I think we're you're out of those, right? Yeah, I'm pretty you... much out of them. But I think um, what I'll do is I'll just upload them on YouTube so folks could. Um, Okay. Could watch it there because it just the, you know, we're not really running a business and we do, right. you know, of course we appreciate those who buy the books and who support our work. If you're not, if you are a Christian, don't support our work. I mean, just study whatever you have, if you buy it, but I'm not asking you for any support, but those of you who, who believe in our work, please do support it. I don't know love. אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו, ימלוך נורא, והוא היה 